arrange for an apartment for them. Mr. Kaufman put him up in a sleazy apartment and it was awful. Motley Crue lived on Clark Street, just a half a block above the whiskey. Tommy called me up, oh, you gotta see, you gotta see, we got our first apartment, you know. So I said, well, all right, what number is it? He goes, don't worry, you'll find it. The door was like coming off the hinges. Well, there was a mountain of beer cans outside. There was one plant in the corner, it was dead. It was pretty destroyed. The apartment was done. Every time they did a show, there was an after party. They'd announce on stage, hey, everybody, there's a party at the house tonight. Come on up the street. Next thing you know, half of L.A. is showing up. People just drinking. There's girls everywhere, wall-to-wall -wall girls. Blonde, big little clothing. They all want Nikki Six. They were wearing their own half naked in there. I hated it. It was better than the Miss America beauty pageant or Hugh Hefner swimming pool. I'd walk into rooms and just be astonished. I hadn't seen that kind of stuff in my life before. I would hear all the reports about them getting wilder and crazier. And then the cops had kicked down the door so many times that there was no more lock on the door. The only way that Alan and I had to control what the guys did at all was through money. Basically, the group was put on an allowance. If you want money, you have to conduct yourself in a certain way. He gave them $20 each a week to live on. They already needed $2 a week for hairspray. They had no food. They were eating junk. They were basically just living off of whoever will help them out at the time. The money they did have, they would drink it, you know. They would party with it. I brought a McDonald's. When I walked in, I had French fries, and they would split them up. They would count them. One for you, one for you, one for you. And I'm going, this is really sad. Do you guys want some bologna or something? They did everything together, except Nick. Mick was older. He'd been doing this for a long time. The guys used to rag on him for being the old man, but he had been there, done that so many times in the L.A. club scene, he wanted to get out of it. He never had that teenage angst thing. It was always Tommy and Nikki and Vince, the terrible threesome. They hung out at the Rainbow until 2 o'clock every night. One time they were doing lines of coke on the table, and there were girls underneath the table, and I'm not going to venture to what they were doing exactly. They released the Too Fast for Love record on Leather Records, which was their own record company. We self-produced the first album under Kaufman and Kaufman Productions. What they had recorded at the time was really raw. It was just straightforward rock and roll. Over the next year, the plan was to have them play as much as possible. There was apparently some sort of demand for these freaks. They were a complete joke to Hollywood. But you had another population from the suburbs, and they are the ones that actually supported Molly Crew. They sold out a week after whiskey, and there was a line going up the street. We were upstairs in the dressing room. Tommy looks out the window, and he's like, oh my god, you got to come see this. There was a line of people. I mean, out the parking lot and down the Sunset Strip. I'm driving down Sunset Boulevard, and all of a sudden, I see kids lined up down the block to get into a show, and I look up on the marquee, and it's Motley Crue sold out. I'm like, I gotta see what this is about. For an hour and 20 minutes, the crowd just went berserk. And I decided from that moment, if everybody in this room would go this crazy for this band, this group is huge. I went to the next show, and I met them and offered them a deal. management team at Electro had their own way of doing things and their own vision for the group. Alan Kaufman was definitely not a record company guy and didn't have a clue on how the record industry worked. They should have been playing in bigger places. They weren't getting the big bucks that they were hoping to get. Motley Crue felt that Alan couldn't take them to the next level. Motley Crue dropped us. We spent a great deal of money on them and ended up with nothing. Kaufman and Kaufman were entry-level managers. They did the best they could, but Nikki had bigger ideas. The band 
and really wanted to get a strong manager behind them. I was packaging an Aerosmith tour and I got a call from Tom Zutat. Doug said, I'm going to open up a management company and I'm going to have a partner who will be interested in helping break Motley Crue. Doug told me about this psycho band. He said, I must fly out and see what they look like. We saw Motley Crue perform at the Santa Monica Civic Center on New Year's Eve of 1982 and I thought it was a phenomenal show. They were getting heavily into the pyrotechnics. These guys still lit themselves on fire and all the craziest stuff you could possibly do. It was a three ring circus. It was pretty insane. I looked at this and I said, this just needs to be taken from town to town, across the country, around the world. This will work. The next day we had a meeting with the band and signed them. When Doug and I took Molly Crew. It wasn't really a band, it was more like a gang. They were just these four guys that were completely whacked. <laughs> we felt we had to have a plan that would have almost immediate results. The alcohol and, and substance abuse was such that we couldn't take five years to turn this into something, or this organism would destroy itself. <laughs> Electric moved to New York and Bob Krasnow was put in charge. Bob Krasnow didn't get this band. Electra was the home of Linda Ronstadt, Jackson Brown, Joni Mitchell. We showed them pictures of Motley Crue and they were just hysterical. They go, this is a record label, this isn't a circus. Very quickly it got confrontational. Krasnow said, I don't want that music on this label. Electra is going to be a label for real artistes. I'm not really interested in selling music to people who live in the gutter. They didn't know much about this metal world. We thought, well, we have to make a plan to keep this band on the label and turn Krasnow around. The first plan of attack was to start building them in a touring base because they weren't going to get radio. There wasn't a radio programmer that wanted to play Motley Crue. This guy from Apple Computers decides that he wants to throw the California Woodstock called the Us Festival. It was a three-day festival out in the middle of nowhere. We had to pull strings and favors and everything else to get on it. And they had a great lineup, Quiet Riot, Triumph, Judas Priest, Scorpions, Ozzy, and the headliners were Van Halen. I don't think I've ever seen that many people in my life. You heard numbers of any place from 250 to 300,000. Quiet Riot started the show off, and Motley came on second. They were all just flipping out, just scared to death. They stunk. They were an embarrassment. They played horrible. People are missing background vocal cues. I could see their nervousness. They just went up there and raced through a set. You could hardly tell what song they were playing. Westwood One was there with their mobile truck recording. Tommy was so like embarrassed that, that he was actually sobbing. He said, you've got to find a way to stop Westwood One from airing this. This is terrible. But it wasn't about Motley Crue playing. What matters is how the audience reacts, more so than how well you play. When Motley Crue came on, the kids were just nuts. They went in there as a band that played clubs and came out of there knowing that 200,000 people went totally berserk for them. They came off the US Festival and they started to make Shout at the Devil with Tom Warman. My job was get this band on the radio. When we went into the studio, Tommy and Mick were the two easiest people to work with by far. Nikki and Vince took time. I get a screaming phone call from Tom Warman. This guy can't play the bass, meaning Nikki. I said, no sh he never could. He's an entertainer, he's a songwriter, but he's a bass player. Shout at the devil. 